In this exercise, we're going to have a go at some dinosaur action, which should be pretty good fun and give us the opportunity to take a bunch of the stuff that we've seen and learned so far and apply that in new and creative ways. Of course, one of the starting questions that we have to ask ourselves about this is how is our dinosaur going to move? In what way should it be animated? And that's an interesting question that brings us back to further things about body mechanics, styles of cycles, and indeed reference. Now, reference for how dinosaurs moved isn't the easiest thing to come by, obviously, but there are places that we can go looking. Some things, of course, we can take as a given. You can probably bet that the laws of physics affected dinosaurs the same way they affect everything else. And so rules that we've seen like anticipation, follow through, overlap, inertia, weight, all of that standard animation stuff we are going to want to hang on to and we are going to want to put into our animation. And as we've seen, that has been the same whether we're animating vehicles or lamps or humanoid characters. So dinosaurs really should be no exception there. What's also important to consider is, of course, the type of the animation that you're going to create and the purpose of it. Are we doing some cartoon animation with a little toony dinosaur? Are we doing some sort of visual effect sequence for some action adventure story? Or are we doing something more illustrative that would be used in perhaps a documentary or some kind of museum exhibit? This is important because of course that then goes to influence how we're going to address the body mechanics of our dinosaur character, how we approach the structure of any walk or run, its overall gait and so on. And of course, as with other creatures, one of the best things that we can do is go up and start looking up reference for that. Obviously, in the first two cases of cartoon or visual effects action, you have a lot more freedom to be creative and animate the character as you see fit, pretty much. You have a great deal of artistic license and you just do whatever looks cool or serves the needs of the story and so on. In the latter case, however, serving the needs of the story comes down to realism. And to try and get dinosaur action that's going to be realistic and natural, we really need to go about gathering some reference, just as we've seen earlier talking about other creatures. Now, obviously, dinosaur reference footage isn't the easiest thing to come by in the world. You can, you know, go and watch something like Jurassic Park, but all you're really doing then is copying some other animator's interpretation. However, there are areas that we can turn to to get reference for dinosaur locomotion. First of all, we can observe that there are indeed different types of dinosaur. You've got this classical theropod style dinosaur, this bipedal fella, and the anatomy of these guys is very similar to that of birds. So you can look up bird footage, see how, how birds move when they're walking or running along the ground. That's one good place to start. You also need to take into account the size of the animal. This one, for instance, that we're going to be using here, he's just under two meters tall, about six feet tall. So a medium sized theropod. These guys came in a range of sizes from very small little chicken like fellas to obviously enormous guys like T-Rex. What you'll see, of course, looking at reference of birds and in fact any animal, is that the size of the creature has a huge impact upon the way it moves. You take a little sparrow and you watch it sort of flitting around on the ground. It bounces and jumps really fast. You watch something like an ostrich move and it's very different. In the case of the fellow that we've got here, something like an ostrich or an emu being of comparable size is probably not a bad model to follow. So we can go and look up reference footage for that. If we're going bigger, however, we have to take that into account. Here's an interesting fact about how it is that animal size and weight affects the way in which they move. Let's imagine we've got just some basic graph here. And what we have is a line plotting, you know, how big an animal is. This is, you know, smaller animals, this is bigger animals and what have you. As an animal gets bigger, obviously it has more muscle mass and the strength of an animal actually goes up exponentially compared to its size like this. Strength here. Specifically, the strength goes up by the square of the increase in size. 
however, it's not only your strength that increases, it's also your body weight and the body weight increases even more. The weight of the animal goes up even more. In fact, it goes up by the cube of the increase in size. What this means is that there's a diminishing return on getting bigger. Pound for pound, or compared to your own weight, you are stronger the smaller you are. This is why, for instance, you take very small animals like rodents, mice, they can carry or drag something that weighs much more than themselves. The average man can carry a weight pretty much equal to his own body weight. You can get one person on your back and reasonably well manage to carry them. By the time you get up to something the size of an elephant, well, if you put one elephant on the back of another, there is no way it can lift it. Cannot be done. Pound for pound, elephants are very weak, and pound for pound, mice are very strong. What that means, of course, for us, is if we're going to be animating some, you know, tiny little chicken-sized dinosaur, that they can bounce and flit and skip along, no problem. If we're animating something more of this size, about six feet tall, then something like an ostrich isn't a bad model. It can get a good, you know, run. It sort of thunders along quite heavy. However, if we're going to animate something, you know, the size of a T-Rex, then there are certain things it just plain cannot do. It cannot run. It could probably start to work up to a bit of a trot, and certainly being big and having very long legs, it would have had a large stride, and thus it would have been able to move quite quickly. However, proper running along like you see ostriches do, no way, just not possible. In the same way, of course, that elephants don't run. They manage this sort of a trot when you see them, you know, going what is the elephant equivalent of a run. But consider the gallop that we produced on the dog, and of course have a look at gallops for other animals, cats, horses, whatever you like. You'll see that elephants cannot gallop in this fashion, reason being they're just too heavy for the amount of strength that they have. So these basic principles and points of reference in animals really start to give us some information about how we should animate and what we can animate the animal doing. What about other reference? Well, we can look at the skeletons of dinosaurs. They tell us some interesting things. Something particularly interesting in dinosaurs is the hip anatomy. Of course, we're used to, you know, seeing a human hip where you have this, you know, ball joint on the on the femur here, this of course, you know, being the shin and foot. And of course, you've got this socket here in the pelvis. All of this gives you a nice sort of, you know, degree of rotation that's available in the hip. Dinosaur hips are very different, and that's not just theropods like T-Rex, that's all dinosaurs, in that they have their femur bone here, and kneecap and shin, foot, but the head of the femur actually comes off the side here like a pin and it fits into a hip socket which is also essentially pinned or rather having a you know a, a straight hole for this barrel to fit in it's not a ball and socket joint it's a round peg round hole joint there's also no kneecap you have a very block knee and the ankle at least in theropods is fully fused, giving a single plane hinge joint. What does this mean in terms of practicality for posing? Well, it has a very direct consequence that any time you see in some, you know, movie or whatnot where you've got a dinosaur striking some sort of a pose and he's, you know, going like this with the legs turned out to give this sort of, you know, kind of like, rah, sort of pose like this. Let's see it from the front, that. I'm afraid it's impossible. Dinosaurs could not pose their hips like this. The bones simply would not allow it. Also, further twists in the leg of this nature, also just not possible. Any time you have seen that done, it was wrong. Or at least it was unrealistic. Now, whilst dinosaurs did have this, you know, barrel and hole socket to their hip, the actual barrel is in most ever so slightly tapered something like this, rather than being completely square. And of course, we have no soft anatomy 
to know what sort of muscles and ligaments existed within the hip joint. Clearly, there must have been some degree of rotation allowable at the hip, because of course, if there weren't, if there were absolutely none, then that would constrain the leg to moving in a complete plane forwards and backwards only. And if that were true, then you'd have an awful lot of trouble turning, or of course, if you fell over, getting back up again. As such, you probably would have had some small degree of twist rotation coming from the hip, but it would have been very small and minor. So this piece of reference really serves to tell us what sort of poses are allowable. Furthermore, you'll discover that particularly in theropods, let's say here's the pelvis, that the legs were actually mounted on something of an angle like this, with the feet down here and close together. They didn't come straight down at a 90 degree angle. So the hip pin would have slotted in something like this. As such, in most of these theropods, you would have seen a stance something like this, where the feet are closer together than the hips are. And indeed, this is something you see today in many birds. Just how close together would they have held them? That varies a little bit, generally by size. We'll see that in a moment. But before we do, one other important piece of anatomy that we can pick up from the bones, which is the tail. Many of the well-known and popular theropods, things like T. rex or Spinosaurus or Velociraptor, were a class of dinosaur known as Tetanuran. This translates as stiffened tail. And specifically, the bones along the majority of the length of the tail, somewhere between the last three quarters and the last two thirds of it, would actually overlap and interlock one another. What that meant is that rotation and posing of the tail was largely constrained to the top end of it, that piece up near the body. The later section would have had very little, if any, flexibility at all. So again, any time you've seen something like a T-Rex or a Velociraptor with this, you know, curly-whirly sort of serpentine tail, incorrect, would not have been possible. The tail is largely just a balancing device. We've seen a lot, of course, when we've talked about keeping characters on balance as they move around. That's the purpose of the tail in a theropod. It counterbalances the forward part of the body. So what these pieces of information, these references really do, is they start to tell us about how restrictive or liberal our posing can be. It's not so much a guide to movement as it is a guide to pose. But of course, as we work through an animation and we try to get our dinosaur into a given pose and we say, OK, he's off balance here, so I've now got to put, you know, this leg here or bend the tail that way. If you have to do it to maintain, you know, balance or whatnot in such a way that it violates what the skeleton could do, then your pose is probably wrong. If you're flexing and bending the tail for follow through or overlap, and it's wanting to bend too much to give a good sense of weight, then you probably need to try and shift that weight animation to somewhere else in the body. So what about actual movement then, walking, running, and so on? Well, of course, you'll remember when we talked about different quadruped gates, we spoke about the way that a bear lands its paws down and how the specific gait of the bear has a consequence in its footprints. Because of this, we can actually work backwards from the footprints to figure out how something would have walked. Little bit of Googling for a theropod trackway will, of course, reveal many impressions left by dinosaurs as they walked around. And here we see a good theropod trackway. And what we can notice, of course, is the feet being held very close together. Notice this here at the front, this would be the right foot. And so we see that the innermost toe is almost in line with the heel of the left foot. The middle and inner toes of the two feet pretty much overlap one another. And you can see this time and time again in trackway after trackway. One thing worth noticing, with smaller, lighter theropods, their feet are almost perfectly in a central line they just about place one foot directly in front of the other foot as they're walking. 
With the larger theropods, the feet are ever so slightly spaced further apart, with this innermost toe falling on the central line. Again, this is a consequence of the way that the legs and hips were arranged. When the leg was bent, because it's mounted on an angle at the hip, it comes up in this direction. That is how the limb moves up and down and up and down. The feet can overlap because of course when the leg raises up at this angle, no kind of ball movement needed at the hip, the foot winds up here and so of course has clearance past the opposing leg, allowing the two feet to overlap one another when placed on the ground. And that is pretty much it. It's pretty much all we have to go on to try and figure out how these things moved. But if we think about it, it does give us an awful lot of information and we can infer a huge amount from it. Whilst we're here and we're talking about the trackways, let me just point out the trackways of sauropods. Obviously in this example, we're animating theropod, but if you had an interest in animating sauropods, you can see from their trackway, here is the rear foot there is the front foot, then here for the left side, the rear foot, front foot, back to the right side, rear foot, front foot. Notice of course that the rear foot is landing behind the front foot. This tells us that the front foot probably was not lifted before the rear foot came into contact. So whilst you might take a you know big hulking beast like a sauropod and think okay I'll animate it in a similar way to an elephant, I'll give it a similar gait, that is probably wrong. In fact sauropods would have been so big and so heavy that it is quite likely they only moved one leg at a time, it's all they could afford to take off the ground, and you would have wound up with a walk cycle for a sauropod that looked something like this. One leg goes on one side, then the other on the front, then back to the other on the rear, then back to the other on the front. Only one leg being lifted from the ground at any one time. Very slow, very plodding, potentially a long stride length given the size of the rear limbs, but given much shorter stumpier forelimbs compared to the length of the rear limbs in a sauropod, probably not that great a stride length overall. Given the trackways that have been found for sauropods, if you measure the distance between the footfalls, take into account the length of their limbs, you discover that sauropods probably moved at about four to five kilometers per hour. That's about the same pace at which we walk. Really, really slow beasts. So then, having gathered all of our reference and thought through some of the you know basics that we're gonna need to employ when animating this guy, we are ready to begin doing that. So just to help break all of this up a bit, we'll end this video at this point and we'll begin all of our major animation work in the next one.